All right. So this first part is a tutorial, and therefore it's it's mostly for the audience that I was thinking about were students who might be just entering the field. And I wanted to take the, the opportunity right at the beginning to thank the people who taught me and those of all the students who have done research in my group, and those are listed down below, all those graduate students. So let's jump in, and I want to... Uh, really briefly tell you about four different concepts. The first is phase diagrams, and then diffusion, and coarsening, and critical phenomena. These are very general topics. I want to tell you about them in the context of two-dimensional membranes. You already have a huge amount of intuition about this system because you're bringing your experience with three-dimensional liquids. For example, if you have salad dressing, you have some oil and vinegar in a bottle and you shake it up, then you'll get small droplets. Those individual droplets will diffuse around with Brownian motion. When two droplets collide, they coalesce and they coalesce quickly. And that's because uh, everything is a liquid. So they're coalescing on timescales of liquids. And then this process continues, this coarsening process continues until you have only one volume that is the oil and another volume that is the vinegar. So I'm gonna tell you the same sort of story, but in this two dimensional system of a membrane that can do the same thing. Now, where would you find membranes? Membranes often show up in cell membranes, and I've, I've drawn a cartoon of one here at the top. This is a really incredibly simplified cartoon. It has only three types of lipids. It doesn't have the, the full diversity of, it doesn't have any proteins, as a matter of fact, in it. Um, so even within this really simplified system, we can learn a lot. Those individual lipids are amphiphiles. They have one side, a head group that uh, interacts with water that's hydrophilic, and another side, those tails that are hydrophobic. And so they're, they're sort of like little people. And you can think of those people as being able to walk across the entire plane of that membrane. And you have to remember that there are people on both sides of that membrane. And of course, there's more than one type of, of lipid in most membranes that we make. So in that case, we need to consider the interactions between the different types of lipids in that sample. Those different interactions can give rise to phase separation in the membrane. And the particular type of phase separation that I'm going to restrict myself to talking about today is liquid-liquid phase separation. So two coexisting liquid phases. And an interesting experimental note is that to date, if we're talking only about liquid phases, then only two coexisting liquid phases have ever been observed in membranes so far, even when we have n types of lipids. So the Gibbs phase rule, if we have many, many kinds of lipids, the Gibbs phase rule says that we ought to be able to have many different coexisting liquid phases, uh, liquid phases coexisting at the same time. So the Gibbs phase rule says that that's allowed, but it doesn't say that it's required. All right, so let's consider this transition from a case of uh, one uniform liquid phase to two coexisting liquid phases. The one uniform liquid phase exists at a high temperature. And the way that we experimentally see that in the laboratory is to make vesicles. So here's a cartoon of a vesicle drawn by Aurelia Hunokamp Smith. And this vesicle has, it's a, a huge diameter, so 100 microns, single walled shell. It has water on the inside, water on the outside. And one of those lipids is fluorescently labeled. And that fluorescently labeled lipid prefers to be in one of those phases versus the other. And that gives us contrast in the microscope. So let me show you what that really looks like in the microscope. Here's one of those vesicles. It's at a high temperature. That means that that fluorescent label is uniformly distributed across the entire membrane. And next, we're going to decrease the temperature. And let's watch what happens. I'm going to show you this movie three different times throughout this talk. And then at the end, I'm happy to show you to you as many times as you would like. I, I love watching this movie. Um, so temperature decreases. We start to see small circular domains nucleate. They run around on the surface of the vesicle, right, with Brownian motion. 
When two domains collide, they coalesce. The fact that the dark domains can defreeze few, freely and quickly across that vesicle surface tells us that the background phase, that bright phase, is a liquid. The fact that when two dark domains collide, they coalesce quickly tells us that those dark domains are also liquid. So here we have coexistence of two liquid phases. You'll notice that with time, those domains are getting larger. And if we waited a long time, <clears throat> depends on the particular system, so maybe 10 minutes, maybe 20 minutes, we would eventually see that there would be only one domain of each type. There would only be one dark region and one bright region. And this phenomenon that I'm telling you about happens in a taut membrane. So that means that there's just enough membrane to cover the volume that's on the inside of the vesicle. Different things can happen, and I'll tell you a little bit about that in the research talk, when there's excess area in that membrane, when there's more membrane than you need to, to cover. But so far, we're just considering a taut membrane. Okay. How would we write an equation to consider this different phase transition? So if we think about free energy of the system, free energy has an entropic component and an enthalpic component. The entropic component, so it's for this illustration, let's imagine that there are only two different lipids in the system. So we have this uh, dark haired lipid and the beret wearing lipid, okay. So there's an entropy of mixing between these two different lipids and the X1 here represents the mole fraction of that first lipid type, then the gas constant and temperature. And over here on the right hand side, there's an interaction term times the mole fraction of the two lipid types. And if you're new to this field, what I really encourage you to do at this point is to take a screenshot of this equation. And then to play around with it. So you know what the gas constant is. Uh, you know that the mole fractions have to vary between zero and one. Um, you can guess at some temperatures and then you can see what that free energy looks like if you plot the free energy versus the mole fraction of one of those components. So if you play around with these numbers, you'll find cases in which you have only one minimum. And that means that corresponds to a case in which you have one uniform phase, or if you have two minima, and that corresponds to having two coexisting phases. After you've done that, you can make from that a free energy diagram that looks like this. So on the x-axis, we have the membrane composition. That's the fraction of each of those two different lipids. Over here on the right, we have 100% of the dark-haired lipid. And then the y-axis is temperature. At high temperature, we have one uniform phase. At low temperature, we have two coexisting phases. So let's imagine what happens in an experiment. An experiment starts out, let's say, at a high temperature at, oh, I don't know, about 40% of the dark haired lipid. And then we're gonna quench the temperature down to this temperature. That point is unstable. That membrane is going to demix into two coexisting phases and it does so along what's called the tie line. The tie line is marvelous because the end points of the tie line tell you what the mole fractions of the lipids are in each of the two different phases. Let me show you how. Right, so we go from zero to 100 over here. This first end of the tie line is about one fourth of the way across. And that means that this first phase has about one out of four lipids that are of the dark haired lipid. The other end of the tie line is about three fourths of the way across. And that means that three out of the four lipids in this phase are that dark haired lipid. So that tells us what the individual phases are, but now how do we know how much of each phase there is? If we look at this point in the middle, that point acts like a fulcrum. And it says, if we look at how close that fulcrum is to both ends of the tie line, this fulcrum is about one third of the way over to one end of the tie line and about two thirds of the way over to the other side. And that means that the mole, that the amount of each phase is about one third of the phase that is enriched in the dark haired lipid and about two thirds of the phase that is depleted in the dark haired lipid. Okay, that went by kind of fast. So let's do it again. 
Let's start at a different point. Different temperature, different overall mixture of the lipids. Let's quench though to the same temperature. Because we quenched to the same temperature, it's going to demix along the same tie line. And that means that the mole fraction of each of those lipids within the two different phases is the same. So there's a one-fourth and a three-fourths of the mole fractions, but the fulcrum is in a different position. So that says that there's different amounts of the two different phases. So in this case, this fulcrum is has about one third on the right and about two thirds of the line is on the left. And that means that about one third of that membrane is gonna be made of the phase that is depleted in the dark haired lipid and two thirds is going to be in the phase that is enriched in that dark haired lipid. All right, that's for two components. But most membranes contain more than two components. Uh oh, what do we do when we have more components? So what happens when we have three? If we have three, then it's helpful to draw a phase diagram on what's known as a Gibbs phase triangle. And I think this is easiest to see when we consider some colors. So let's imagine that our three different lipids have the colors of magenta and cyan and yellow. And if we have a membrane that's 100% of magenta, then we would represent it down in this corner, in this, at this vertex, versus 100% cyan versus 100% yellow would be up at the top. If we have a membrane that's a binary mixture of two of these, for example, between the cyan and the yellow, then it would be one of these colors of green along that left-hand axis. If we have a ternary mixture of all three, for example, this point in the middle, then we can figure out from the diagram what that mixture actually is. So over, uh, if we look at this, this tan color, that tan color has a lot of yellow in it. How much yellow does it have? Up at the top would be 100% yellow. And if we count, from the bottom, the bottom axis is 0%, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 50% 50 yellow. Okay, how much magenta does it have? 100% magenta would be over on the right vertex. So counting from the left, we have 0, 10, 20, 30. That makes 80% uh, altogether. The, everything has to add up to 100%. So the remaining 20% is due to the cyan. All right, that's how you would plot your data. Let's look at some actual data. These data were taken by Sarah Beach for this particular ternary mixture of lipids. Here's one with a high melting temperature. Here's one with a low melting temperature. And here is cholesterol. Each data point that I'm showing you here represents a ratio of those three lipids that phase separates into two coexisting phases. And now I need to specify the temperature at 32 degrees. So each different temperature will give a separate one of these phase diagrams. So a temperature sweep is a stack of figures like this one. Okay, the last point that I want to make in this section about phase diagrams is that Previously, it was easy to determine where the tie line was. We just chose a particular temperature and drew a horizontal line at that temperature. When we have a ternary phase diagram, it's, we can't predict what that particular tie line is going to be, and so we have to measure it. Here's the particular tie line for this mixture of lipids. You'll notice that one end of the tie line is very close to this vertex. That means that that phase is highly enriched in this particular lipid and the other end is far away. So it's depleted of the, the lipid that's over here in this cyan part, the diphytonyl PC. All right, let's take that next to thinking about diffusion. When we watched this movie before, something that was really visually striking is how those domains move. So we start off with a bunch of small domains and those domains move pretty fast. And as they collide with other domains and coalesce with them, they're getting bigger and they're moving more slowly. And the way that we think about diffusion is exactly in, uh, in those parameters of thinking about how far does a domain move in a particular amount of time. So here's the equation that we tend to think of. 
over here on the left, we have a mean squared displacement. So that's a square of a displacement means that it's gonna come in units of length squared. And over on the far right, there's time. They are related through a diffusion coefficient, which must have the units of length squared divided by time. Now, a huge question is, what exactly do we plug in for that diffusion coefficient? That diffusion coefficient is dependent on the radius of the domain, right? The larger the radius is, the smaller uh, the diffusion coefficient is going to be. But what is the exact equation that we should use? What expression applies? There's also an intuition that it, that it doesn't just depend on the radius, it must depend on the medium in which that domain is diffusing. So we need to think about the two-dimensional viscosity of the membrane and also the three-dimensional viscosity of the water. These two viscosities have different units that are associated with them because they're different dimensionalities. Okay, what equations might apply? There are two limits in which this problem can be solved analytically. And of course, anything in between is, is also valid, but there are two limits where there are straightforward equations. The one on the left, the first limit is when you have large domains or a low membrane viscosity. And the one on the right is if you have small domains or a high membrane viscosity. And here are the two equations for them. Um, rather than derive them, I wanna just, have you able to have some take home messages about them. The first is that you'll notice that both of them have a dependence on the three dimensional viscosity. And, and why is that? That's because those lipid head groups are hydrophilic and they interact with the water, the bulk water that's outside of that vesicle. Um, you'll also notice that the two dimensional viscosity only shows up in that equation on the right when there's a high membrane viscosity in the system. Um, you'll notice that both of these diffusion coefficients get smaller as the domain radius r gets larger. The one on the left goes as d is one over r and the one on the right has a log term in it. The equation on the left is a little bit easier to think about because if diffusion goes as one over the radius, then if we plot all of our data as diffusion coefficient versus radius, log diffusion coefficient versus the log of the radius, our data should fall on a straight line with a slope of negative one. So that's exactly what we did. Here are data that are for uh, watching a lot of different vesicles over time and watching how individual domains of radius are, that's on the x-axis, how they diffuse, uh, measuring their diffusion coefficient, which is what's on the y-axis, and both of these are a log-log scale. Up on the top, there's a dotted line which has a slope of negative one, and you'll see that our data fall roughly along a slope of negative one. So to first order, our diffusion coefficient looks like one over the radius. But this particular equation, it's up on the right-hand side, the exact solution of that is the slope that's on the top. And there's an offset in our data. And that offset tells us that it isn't entirely due to that equation up on the top. So first order looks like one over r, but actually to get a good quantitative agreement, we need to add in that two-dimensional membrane viscosity. And a bonus of doing that, this isn't a bug, it's a feature. A bonus of that is that that gives us a single parameter fit for what that two-dimensional viscosity actually is. That leads us to talking about coarsening. Coarsening is a, a term that talks about when those individual domains are colliding and coalescing, what is the rate at which they're getting bigger? So the mathematical way of saying that is that if the radius increases as time to some exponent alpha, we'd like to know what that exponent alpha is. And we can get very far by making some very easy assumptions. So let me walk you through that. The, the drawing on the left is our before picture. We have a lot of different domains and they're separated by a distance L, a length L. And the, that particular length between the domains uh, is proportional, it scales with the radius of those domains. So if all of those domains come together and coalesce into one domain, then the distance from the, to the next domain is gonna be larger. 
The second easy assumption is that our domains are growing entirely by colliding and coalescing. Okay, let's see how far that gets us. Our diffusion equation says that a length squared, that mean squared displacement squared, is proportional to a diffusion coefficient, which depends on radius, times the time. Okay, we've just said that the length that needs to be over which those domains need to diffuse is proportional to the radius of those domains. So using that first assumption, we can put in radius for length, we get a radius squared. Now we have a diffusion coefficient. What should we plug in for that diffusion coefficient? Well, we just showed that the diffusion coefficient is first order, the same thing as one over the radius. So if we plug one over radius for the diffusion coefficient, we get that the radius should grow as time to the one third. And now do the same sorts of experiments, look at many vesicles over time and measure the normalized radius, which is on the y-axis, versus the time. And uh, because this is a log-log scale, the slope of that line is going to give us the exponent. And what we find is that that exponent is within experimental uncertainty of one-third. The last topic that I want to talk to you about is critical phenomena. I showed you a picture of uh, previously of a phase diagram that, and we, we talked about going across the phase diagram over on the left-hand side, for example, from a high temperature to a low temperature. Now let's imagine a case in which we go through that phase diagram right in the middle, and that's going through a critical point. Let me take a moment to explain what a critical point is. The last time that you thought about critical points may have been when you thought about the phase diagram of water. So let's return back to that comfortable place. Uh, phase diagrams of water have a big Sarah, quick uh, reminder, three minutes left. Marvelous. Um, we have a vapor, liquid, and solid. The critical point is up here at the end. And a great thing about that critical point is it's the place that's associated with fluctuations. If we, but the way that I've talked about this phase diagram uh, is much more intuitive for us if we think about a parameter like molar volume. What's really the difference between the two phases is their densities. So if we now rotate that phase diagram, we can really see this coexistence between the liquid and the vapor phase. And up here, there's the critical point. If we look at that phase diagram from above, then we get a diagram that we've just seen before, really familiar, right? So if we uh, relabel those axes from the water phase diagram. We recover the, the axes for a lipid phase diagram. And now taking quench, taking movies of this system at different temperatures, and this was done by Aurelia Hohner Camp Smith, we can now see the fluctuations that occur. At, at a point that's a little bit further away from the critical point, there are small fluctuations that wink in and out of existence on a fast time scale. Now closer to the critical point, these fluctuations are larger. In both cases, they're micron scale, which is pretty exciting, and they stay around for longer. Here again, we have a, an opportunity to relate a distance to a time that reminds us of a diffusion coefficient. Um, and there's a length scale in there that depends on how close we were to the critical point. And it does so through a critical exponent. The value of that exponent depends on the dimensionality of the system. The, the system that makes the most sense for us is the 2D Ising model. And when we measure that coefficient, it's consistent with the 2D system rather than the 3D system. If we now think about a diffusion coefficient, because we're near a critical regime, things are a little bit trickier. So a diffusion coefficient we normally think of as having units of a length squared divided by a time. Here, we have a length to the something divided by a time. And what that something is depends on many parameters in the system. It depends on whether the order parameter is conserved in our system. Um, it depends on how the fluctuations dissipate. To make a long story short, in a beautiful paper by Aurelia that you should read, I put the reference down at the bottom. The answer is that we need to think about coupling 
between the two-dimensional viscosity and the three-dimensional viscosity. So it's a consistent story that shows up over and over again, thinking about the coarsening and in the critical phenomena. So I've told you about four different concepts. And I think that upon entering the field, um, you might think that it's the concepts that are important, but really I'd like to make an argument that it's the people who are important. Behind all of these concepts, the way that I learned about these concepts was through the people who took the data. So here are pictures of all of the graduate students who have worked on those four concepts in my laboratory. Um, and I've learned a tremendous amount from all of them. In addition, of course, I've learned a huge amount from the undergraduates in our lab, the collaborators on all of our papers, and moreover, there are people out in the community who've let us use their microscopes, who've lent us their time and their expertise. So I'd like to say, sure, come to Membrane Biophysics for the concepts, and you should really stay for the people. And with that, I'd be happy to take some questions. Okay, great. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so we have a couple um, a couple questions to start off with. Um, the first one from Eric Dufresne led to some interesting discussion in the chat, but we'll hear what you have to say about it first. Um, so so Eric asked um, said that the phase separation phase separated protein people like to measure uh, sorry use the dynamics of fusion of domains to measure a capillary velocity, which depends on the viscosity and surface tension. Can you use the fusion of your domains to measure the viscosity of the bilayer membrane or the edge tension? And from, yes. we had, we had, yeah, so there were comments in the chat from Brian Camley and Kirsty Wan and Aurelia Honerkamp Smith that seem to say the answer to this is yes, but let's hear your comments on it also. Oh, they are the experts. So yeah, whatever they put in the chat, that's right. Um, I can't see the chat here, so I don't, that, I don't know what that, it is. That, that, um, that, that, the, okay. the short answer to that is that the real expert in this is this. Uh, person over here, Elizabeth Mann, and she exactly does that. She looks at cases where two domains are coming together and then they make that kind of figure eight. And then you look at the time that's required for that to become a circle. And from that, you can get the, the two dimensional viscosity from that system. It's, it's super cool. Is, is it, does it also tell you anything about edge tension? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you could get both. Cool. Um, good. So another question from Eric Dufresne, um, uh, he asked if membrane curvature can affect the coarsening. Yes. So everything that I've told you about is in a super huge vesicle, right? 100 microns. Um, and then the size of the domains, we stop looking at the coarsening. Uh, sorry. Um, we start, we stop using the data when those domains become about one tenth of the size of the vesicle. Um, and that's because you can imagine that if you have a, a domain that is a large fraction of the individual vesicle, then it's going to entrain a lot of the fluid that's inside. And you can imagine a case in, in which a domain that's moving is making the fluid on the inside of the vesicle move, which is making a, a domain on the other side also move, right? So they'll be coupled in that way. And the way that I'm talking about it isn't talking about necessarily curvature as much as it is the size of the domain versus the size of the vesicle. There should also be cases in which curvature makes a difference. We haven't seen that in our system, but that said, we're always doing fluorescence microscopy. So all of our vesicles are pretty large. Okay, thanks. Um, I think we'll have time for, for one more for now. Um, Greg Huber asked if you know in your system how broad or wide the critical region is. Yes. Um, uh, I want to show you data, but I don't have it in this talk. Um, <laughs> could you That's email okay. me, and then I'll uh, Greg. Could you email me, and then I'll I'll show you where that is in the the actual data, because yeah. that's it's much more fun to look at actual data. Okay. Greg Greg, okay, says, noticed, Greg says yes to email. Yeah. Okay, great. Now I noticed that uh, both of these questions were from experts in the field. And what I would love to encourage trainees to ask questions too. Yes, yes, agreed. Um, we, so we do have a, a question I'll go ahead and go to from um, Haoran Ni, nee, who asked if M, uh, membrane undulation plays an important role in lipid phase separation. Uh, 
Yes. So, I mean, we need to, th to think about um, where that where entropy comes from in the system and those undulations are especially important when we start to think about a, a membrane that is close to a surface because being close to a surface is going to dampen those undulations and so there, there have been results by uh, other labs um, that have shown really beautifully that if you take a vesicle that would be phase separated and you bring it down to a surface, that the liquid ordered phase, one of those phases will preferentially be near that surface and that will be the phase that has uh, less undulations in this, that gives up less entropy by, by losing the undulations on the surface. Short answer, yes. <laughs> 